Welcome, 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 um, everyone. My name is Mark Caesar, and thank you for being here on Financial Freedom through Apartment Investing, a proud affiliate of the GOB Network of Apartment Investors. And today we have Mr. Larry Pendleton Jr., who is our keynote speaker. And just a brief uh, background on Larry. He has been a CPA for over eight years with experience in tech consulting and preparation, accounting and financial statement audit auditing, he brings over six years of real estate experience as a multifamily investor involved in syndications, joint ventures, asset management, tax strategies, investor relations, and underwriting. Larry is also the co-founder and senior partner of PC Financial Services. Uh, being real estate investors themselves, Larry and his partner, Terion Conyers, add value to other professionals in real estate by implementing tips and strategies to maximize their clients' tax benefits. Larry also holds key finance, finance and accounting positions for several real estate firms, such as CP Realty and Rise Equity Group Holding. Not only does he oversee the finance and accounting for those organizations, he adds value by implementing the same tax strategies he applies to his own portfolio and recommends his clients in order to maximize their investor returns. Most importantly, Larry is married to his beautiful wife, Whitney, and the proud father of two of their sons, handsome sons, Larry III and Wesley. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Pendleton. Larry, thank you for being here with us. I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule to speak to, to everyone today and educating us on, on taxes and what you do as a CPA. I appreciate you, appreciate you, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody, for hopping on and uh, willing to listen to talk about taxes <laughs> this this evening. Hope I don't put everybody to sleep. Um, but I appreciate the uh, the introduction. I, I did prepare um, some slides, uh, Mark. If you want to give me access to share, I sure will. You should be good now. All right. Cool. So, um, so yeah. So, as 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 Mark mentioned, I've been involved with just taxes for over over a decade. Eight of it as a as a CPA. Um, I've always known the benefits of of real estate when it comes to um, how that offsets uh, a lot of tax benefits from that standpoint. So when Mark asked me, I kind of thought a lot of different directions to kind of go tonight. And since we just ended tax season, um, I thought I'd kind of take a bit of a pivot uh, to what I've kind of noticed uh, over the years of doing it. But it's like, okay, here's what really a lot of real estate investors are kind of missing out on. Um, I mean, maybe because they just don't know or maybe they just um, aren't fully informed or just, just not in a position to take advantage of it. But it's like, okay, here's what I'm seeing on a lot of people's tax returns. And I just want to kind of de dig deeper uh, in a way and hope I don't take no more than 15, 20 minutes of, of, of y'all time tonight to kind of talk through it. Like I prefer to answer as many questions as possible to kind of make this more engaging. Um, I feel like that's more beneficial to everyone instead of just me uh, rambling and going through slides. Uh, but like, please interrupt. Um, I'm happy to, to address anything and, and kind of go from there. Um, Mark mentioned a lot about my introduction. Like uh, in an introduction, I'm born and raised out in North Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. Um, if you're not familiar, Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach, Southeastern Virginia. Um, the funny thing about how I even got interested in accounting was um, a crush on a on a high school teacher. Uh, that's not her per se in the in the picture. That's that that's my current wife. Whitney didn't work out with the teacher. I can't remember why. But either way, I was able to kind of grasp the concept of of accounting as oddly as that sounds. Like I, your proverbial numbers geek and all of that. And like I said, I, I truly have a mission to help people reach financial freedom. Uh, through educating through real estate and how taxes can um, can help support that along the way. Um, as, I, as I tell all my clients or people who have consultation with me, uh, I am I don't really don't care how you feel about Trump per se. Like he's been good for my business. I am 
95% sure if I had all of his documentation, I could probably get him to the $750 as well. Um, just because like he's ingrained in real estate and, and all the aspects of it as well. And all the laws that he passed, like didn't really, it wasn't new for investors. It just put more fuel to that fire um, from that standpoint. So we'll see what Biden ends up doing uh, trying and trying to reverse possibly a lot of that or get rid of certain things, which um, there, there's just too many other benefits and loopholes to, to take advantage of to worry about. No one, no one's going to be able to kind of take out every single thing. So it just takes more planning. But that's just kind of how my mindset is, is just to kind of give you an introduction of, of who you're, who's speaking. So that's how my mind works and just constantly trying to find ways to uh, reduce taxes, kind of have people break even at zero. I, mean, I know people want large refunds, but that's just getting your money back. The real goal with the tax code is to break even. And real estate is one of the probably the best way to do it, just in, in my opinion. So uh, just disclaimer, this is more for informational purposes. Um, I'm happy to to kind of talk offline of anything in particular or anything that you may hear. You, you, you do. You should talk to your legal team, talk to your your tax professional and just make sure that whatever I go through the night applies to you. And uh, hopefully, um, hopefully this is this will be a value for everybody um, on the on the call. So, well, my things are messing up. I'm not sure, but here's the things I want to go over uh, uh, where I kind of see where people are, are missing out at um, from just who's your tax professional, better understanding of cost segregation, uh, safe harbor elections when it comes to repair costs. Uh, that's a big one. Uh, real estate professional status. Everyone kind of hears about it. I see a lot of mistakes of people who can qualify and don't do it, and people that shouldn't be <laughs> shouldn't be uh, doing it and and, uh, and and checking that box and putting themselves in the position. And also, as an investor, like invest where you vacation at. Like, so it's kind of lighten the mood up a bit since we're since we're in the summertime or late spring uh, summertime. So. But just take advantage of, of, of stuff like that. So, uh, so the one issue that I kind of see a lot with people, and, and is is it's cliche and it's probably a bit self-serving, but it's like finding the right tax pro. Um, what people don't realize is that tax professionals are kind of like doctors, and the tax code is is pretty similar to the human body. Where if you have a toothache you're not going to go to a heart surgeon. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. You have a foot ache, you're not going to go to a brain surgeon. Like it's, like, it's different parts of the body that you go to a certain doctor for. And same thing with tax professionals. Like, you have some that are just kind of uh, jack-of-all-trades can kind of scratch the surface on everything, but they can't really go into the, the, the nitty-gritty of those loopholes that you're looking for to help reduce. Um, or you're just maybe consulting with the wrong one who who are kind of specialized in, in other realms. Like I, said, I converted my business to focus primarily on real estate uh, about three years ago um, because of the advice of, of one of my mentors, as well as um, just kind of seeing where my portfolio was going and seeing how I can add value and increase my network of potential partners and and, and capital and and, and, and KPs and all and all that as well. So it's, it's very important to kind of see whoever you're interviewing, whether it's me or whoever, just like making sure they are in line with what you're trying to do, uh, because that relationship is constantly evolving. I mean, your your life never stays the same. Either you don't have kids and you're about to have kids, or your kids are getting older and they're about to move out or your kids are old enough where they can start working for you, um, or you may need to put money in retirement, or you're, about to, or you're trying to leave your job. So you're like each year or throughout each year, like that relationship between you and your tax pro should be constantly growing and there should be constant communication um, because because like everything that you do is com could possibly affect how your tax position is. And a lot of times people just kind of wait until the end of the year, um, maybe maybe the end of the calendar year but probably just in tax season that'll be the first time they hear or reach out to their tax pro uh i'm more in the line of at least two to three times a year of course during tax season and then probably about mid mid year just to kind of see what what's been going on while i've been in the midst of tax season as well as let's look into late third quarter early fourth quarter 
Oh, just start seeing how to wrap the year off strong and and start positioning things from that standpoint there. Um, and just remember that that additional service, like is is a fee, but it's an investment as well as a business expense. So you can not only just write off whatever you pay for your tax professional, but you're also that's an investment because that person should be opening up other opportunities for you, whether it's time because you're not having to deal with your taxes or they may be um, giving advice that, okay, if you do this, it's going to open up $10,000 worth of tax deductions. Like they should be adding some type of value where it's, it seems more of this as an investment into your business, into your portfolio, as well as a, a, a tax deduction because it's because you can write off, um, write off that service as well. So, um, before I move on, kind of questions um, regarding this. Uh, like I said, I really want this to be as interactive as possible, but I'll just kind of open up to the floor if anyone has any questions. I have a question. Yep. So <clears throat> I totally get the tax professionals are like doctors. Uh, what are a couple of key points that, uh, you know, if you're vetting uh, a, good C a good CPA, what are a couple of key things that you should know about them or they should or they should you know they should know about what we're trying to do on commercial real estate obviously but what are some of the red flags maybe you know that, to stay away from i think more in the in the realm of are they ultra conservative um whereas you can probably tell like okay they know certain things and they're not going to really recommend them or if you're because you're playing the gray area quite a bit, especially in the tax code. So it's, you could get someone that's like overly conservative and was like, okay, like, have you done uh, 1031s or have you recommended um, a particular write-offs per se, whether it's cost irrigation or, or, or from that standpoint there. And they may be like, don't really know. And that's why they're conservative or they just do not want to put themselves in a situation where their client could potentially be audited uh, because I mean, but you can still be, you can still be ultra conservative and still be audited. It's just all about where, um, uh, how you're properly documenting stuff. And that could be a red flag as well. If, if they're not recommending documentation, documentation, documentation as annoying and tedious as that sounds. And I even hate it as an accountant myself, I completely understand, but that paperwork on the front end, like that is what's going to cover your ass on the back end. And I tell all my clients, I cannot protect your blind side. If I'm going to be your left tackle, if I'm just, if I'm just really nearly recommending stuff to you without any support. So that could be a red flag as well. where like, they're ultra aggressive, but not getting you like, but not putting you in a state of comfort of, um, of, of, of being audit ready. You can never be audit proof. You could be audit ready though. Larry. Yes, sir. Do you find that to be with uh, uh, CPAs who are not into um, investing and into commercial multifamily investing? Uh, yes, and, and thanks, James, for the question. And thank you, Daryl, for, for your question. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, you can only be as aggressive as what you know. Now, I know everyone's like, okay, I'm not going to work with a CPA or tax professional unless they also are investors as well. And, and, and that could help like give you some comfort that okay they know what that like what the world is like what that uh, what it is to be in that ring from that standpoint so they can they can kind of know like what to what to recommend are they are they consulting with others from that standpoint there so so to your point is like like people are only going to be as aggressive with what they know or are they comfortable with so if you're dealing with someone who's, who hasn't done commercial real estate or hasn't done real estate much at all, um they may I mean, I, I've, I've known tax professionals who haven't like recommended depreciation because they're scared about depreciation recapture on the back end which is a true concern but me as an investor and where my where my mindset is now is like i'm in i'm in growth phase i mean i'm bullish with the with the market if i can find some of the numbers work i'm gonna buy it because i'm probably going to offload something that's going to create capital gain and then I'm going to buy something else that's going to create a loss that's going to offset that gain whether by 1031 it or just offset it straightforward so I mean so that's just I mean I just kind of get real casual about it because I'm 
I'm in that world. I'm comfortable with it. So to your point, yes, if they're not in it, uh, or if they're not if they're not in, have a, a a a large at least a large clientele in commercial real estate or with real estate in general, then you may be working with someone who may not be a good fit for you. Well, we Thank have you. Also, from Marquise Jackson, who's asking, "What's the best way to hire your children?" Yeah, uh, that's always the million dollar question, ain't it? So, uh, so yeah. So now you're looking at to um, the best way to look at it to simplify it as as easy as I can is like if you were running a business and you hire somebody, aren't you going to have some type of employment documents, uh, some type of um, fee schedule or expectation job like job uh listing of job responsibilities so you're hiring your children in that same route where it's like okay can you maximize the full twelve thousand or twelve thousand two hundred to be exact um like yes but like are the services that they are providing would that equate to that if you were offer that job to the market and just got somebody off of whatever thumbtack or something uh, from that standpoint there so it's really once again you're you're building the base documentation of okay you have employment agreements in place um you have them with their own bank account so that money is coming out of the business into their bank account so you can actually create a paper trail from that standpoint there so that's the best way to do it is to really treat it as if you were going to hire um uh, somebody from around the corner and you, you want to make sure like I got everything listed out like here's his expectations and all of that here's what the pay is what's compared to the market you're not it's okay to be above market but like don't get excessive because that's when you get your hand slapped uh, when you get uh, excessive with the whole like halls get eaten um, or pigs get fat halls get eaten something like that <laughs> I think that's all the questions we have in the chat right now. Cool, great. Thanks for the question, Marquis. Good stuff. Um, another benefit, and I think everyone's aware of cost irrigation, but it's like, like really, like, what is it from that from that standpoint? And I see a lot of people kind of missing out on an opportunity. And I'm gonna go deeper into it as we as we go on. But the basis of it is that. Of depreciation itself is that I mean if we can write off the cost of the buy a building we'll do that <laughs> but because it's an income producing asset we're like we're not allowed to do it but because you're providing housing for the masses you're technically partnering with the government um, to provide a service that the government is like okay to incentivize more people to do this here you can recognize the cost of that building over over a certain amount of time which is basically taking the building, breaking it up to 27 and a half years, and then you get that uh, paper loss or paper deduction on your financials. Like no money came out of pocket for that, even though you may have gotten a loan for 20, 30% down, you get 100% benefit of the depreciation. How you maximize your depreciation is that it takes that cost of the building, let's just say it's a million dollars, and let's just hypothetically say that 30% of it is actual personal property, and that should be, or it was a misspelled, uh, that's on me, um, or land improvements that depreciate at a faster rate than, than the building itself at 27 and a half years. Because you got five year property, you got seven year property, and you got 15 year property. So if you're all going off of the time value of money that the dollars worth more now than it is in the future and i much rather stack up as many um losses and deductions as i can now especially if you're working with passive investors and giving them opportunity to make money on your deal and not pay any taxes on it okay let's 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 wreck let's just bones appreciate this stuff take advantage of it. as well as you before you even think about bones appreciation you have properties that depreciate at five years so that's going to be quicker than 27 and a half years as well as doing the bone depreciation and recognizing all of that in year one and then once again in a in a growth mindset you're going to buy another property which is going to once again offset that uh give you another opportunity to do a cost irrigation get quicker depreciation and, and, and build from there the 
one of the things that's kind of a, a lot of times that I see missing that people don't that that even do cost segregation that don't do is that the asset the the concept of asset disposition, which means that if you had a roof, okay, and you didn't do a cost segregation, the value of that old roof is in that sales price number, and you've replaced the whole roof, you now are depreciating two roofs. The cost segregation basically breaks out that cost of the roof. So now if you replace that roof, you can write off the old value uh, of the old roof, which because you're not going to be depreciating the whole new roof from that standpoint. So now you, like I say, now you're able to, once again, create a, a huge loss off your books that's going to help offset the cost of the new roof in a way. So in, it's like, so you somewhat be able to offset, uh, offset costs along the way as well. Um, and there's also a misconception that you have to be a real estate professional to take advantage of this, which is which is not true. Uh, whether it was you or your investors, depending on where every, where your particular um, uh, adjusted gross income is, if it's less than a hundred thousand, you can claim up to twenty five thousand dollars of passive losses without being a real estate professional. So, so that's it's kind of a misconception that's kind of put out there for those that that, that don't know or just kind of, once again overly conservative of scared of people checking that real estate professional box or was like, okay you can you don't even have to check that box and still take advantage of what a cost segregation does may not be the full benefit or the full loss but if you can get twenty five thousand dollars deduction loss to recognize on your tax return I don't see too many too many people complaining about that maybe the IRS but that's on them. Uh, a lot going on here, a lot of stuff, like, once again, I'm going to open it up, any questions before we move on? Yeah, I, I had a quick question there, Mark. Right ahead, Ken. Yeah, uh, great information, Larry. Uh, this question, is there a certain yes, timeline, uh, or what, is there a timeline after you acquire a property that you want to do a cost sake, or can you do it like a year after acquisition when you realize you, you may may benefit you better, or do you have to take it like the year that you acquire a property? You can you can get a cost segregation at any point. You can do it twenty years from now, and, and like whether whether it's valuable at that point is another thing. Is and I think the sweet spot from just the, the networks that I'm in, the little CPA geek networks that I'm in, like we're we're saying roughly three to five years is kind of at that at that sweet spot where okay you can um now you're now anything beyond that you already have fully depreciated the five year property, <clears throat> which is most of, which is most of what's gonna be segregated out from that standpoint. But it is best is is ideal to do it um for the year that you acquire it doesn't have to be within the calendar year so if you bought a property in 2021 you don't have to get the cost segregation done in 2021 you can get you can get it done in 2022 before you file your taxes and apply it to your 2021 taxes and and, and of course get the um depreciation built up there okay and then uh sort of a follow-up question that you just say you take bought a property you say like 2020 or like two or three years ago and you do a cost seg this year like a, a one or two years afterwards do you still get the the whole five years of like the bonus depreciation or is it five years from from the actual purchase when you when you started the depreciation so it's from the from the year of the the acquisition of the property and then now you're looking to do you amend those prior years to get your depreciation schedule caught up or you can or you can file a 3115 which is a a hell of a form to fill out because it's basically going to take everything and get you all caught up in year one. Uh, so it, it does become a timing aspect of it. Of is it even worth it to do it in year one? Um, if you're working with, with, with your, with your passive investors, um, it may be in that everyone is kind of stacking up losses uh, for when you eventually, eventually sell the property and you can offset some of the gains from the losses that haven't been recognized. Um, but yeah, you, you, you can, like I said, if you bought in 2019 and you're now in 2021, you can do a 3115, have everything caught up, and then you just recognize everything in 2020, your 2021 taxes. 
Thank you, Ken. Uh, so you're clear to go. No more questions in the chat right now, Larry. One question. Hey, I'll make... Oh, oh there we go. How's everybody doing? Um, thank you, Larry, for for the um, um, presentation you're doing so far. As a for cost segregation, is the cost segregation just for um, multifamily, commercial multifamily? Or can you use that for residential multifamily also? Uh, great question and one that I hop like because people assume and I, if I had more space like my wife hates when I kind of clutter the slides but if I, I would have threw it in here that it, it does not have to be large apartment buildings like you can do it for a house or you can do it for a townhome um, as long as it's real estate like you can do a call set gauge for any type of property and you're still looking at somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of that sales price um, put into, let's say, in that five, seven, 15 year uh, buckets for either a faster depreciation or bonus depreciation. So um, there's no, you have to be over a certain number of units or dollar amount for it to be a value. It's just whether or not it's your particular situation is what determines it. Okay, thank you, thank you. So while well, we're on that question, right? So let's say you own the house for a couple, more than a couple of years, like 20 years. Right, um, mm -hmm. is this something you can do about that? With cost segregation wise, you get, you get get a new roof put on uh, this year and got a new get a new boiler. Would that be worth it or no? At that point, it's probably not because most of that stuff is is fully depreciated. Um, mm -hmm. So even the even the write off of that stuff from a, the asset disposition, like okay, there's there's no value left. Okay. Um, to, to to really recognize. So I said you can. I said that's why I said I don't say no. It's just. It's just not going to be as valuable, valuable as if you kind of get it within that. Um, always kind of shoot for that first year. I know people are kind of like don't like suspended passive losses, but I said unless you plan on selling the property quick, um, it's not worth. The only time, only time cost segregation is not worth it if you plan on selling the property within within five years. But if you plan on holding it long term, like it's it's worth it to do it within that three to five year, or at least within five years of you acquiring the property. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So I do have a question for you, Larry, and this is not pertaining to um, cost seg or anything like that. But um, if someone is working a W two and they love what they do or whatever the case may be, and their the main hiccup is they're paying so much in taxes how does real estate, how can they use real estate to help them uh, sort of stay neutral on, on those, on that W-2 tax, if that makes any sense, if I'm, hope I'm wording the question correctly. You're, ju you're, you're, ju you're jumping the gun on me, Mark, but I'll, I'll address a little, I'll address part of it. So sorry. Um, but no, you know, you <laughs> no, so the, the W-2 aspect of it is, 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 is rather, that's the that's the that's the lock everyone's trying to like figure out because I say that's where you most of your taxes is going to come from from that standpoint where you're almost going to take a Warren Buffett approach of at least for real estate you can increase the amount of income that you make that that's subject to not be taxed so you can make a lot of money in real estate claim a bunch of paper losses that's not cash out of pocket which is offset offset your income now you're at zero. From that standpoint there so that's one way real estate can help uh from 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 that standpoint where like at least you're in from a holistic view you increase your income so much and that's not going to be taxed where like okay what you are paying in taxes is really a small percentage of all the income that you're making okay if that makes that makes sense um uh, so is that is that standpoint there is also like say if you even if you're working a W two and uh, I mentioned before if you, and you're making less than a hundred thousand dollars you can you can you, you have up to twenty five thousand dollars of passive losses that you can from your real estate that you can offset your W two income with and then for every dollar above a hundred it phases down too so by the time you get to one hundred and fifty you completely phased out but you have opportunities to now once again. 
have tax losses from your rental properties. They're operating in the black, but there's a tax loss in the red because of stuff like depreciation and other expenses to help offset it. And, and now you can recognize that on your taxes to an extent. Gotcha. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. And I'll get into the, the to additional stuff to that as, as we, as we move on. uh safe harbor elections um so what so what these are is that what i see a lot in people's tax returns is that i see kitchen renovations on the depreciation schedule because they pay ten thousand to 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 rehab a kitchen and it's like okay what like unfortunately you have to depreciate that over 27 and a half years and it's like if 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 you don't go into detail with your contractor and figuring out like what is like breaking that stuff out, like you're, you're having to depreciate something over an extended period of time that you have opportunity to expense now in the, in the current future. And once again, we're talking about the time value of money and depreciation is, is great. And to an extent, but being able to just expense something is way better. Um, because there's no, you, you're not tracking stuff over a certain number of years. You don't have the depreciation recapture. So you much rather expense it while you can. And the safe harbor elections provides, um, basically guidelines on like how to, like if an expense should be depreciate, if a repair cost should be expensed or depreciated based on dollar value, what's being repaired, the size of the property, and, and a whole bunch of other different things that I just kind of named a few right here. Um, and once again, we're kind of going back to why expensing is better than just depreciating, even though depreciation creates an expense, but there's, there's no back-end caveats with just expensing from that standpoint. So like I said, once again, we're talking about time value of money, being able to recognize more deductions now and not break it out into future years and reducing our capital gains uh, in the future and for your investors because now like we have less depreciation recapture that you have to deal with. So in that same example of kitchen re rehab, $10,000, okay, let's get those things itemized into invoices where it's like you have a materials invoice and a labor invoice and a detailed breakout of of what everything that they're doing. Is it tedious and annoying for your contractor? Yes, but you're the customer and then you're trying to better run your business and have better numbers to report uh, to your investors instead of like being able to like basically be able to write off more in, in this year. So um, this one I, I see missed a lot because I mean, like I said, people, don't want to have those conversations with their contractor. Contractors don't want to do it, or they're working with somebody under the table, so they're not getting <laughs> voices at all. So they're kind of putting themselves in a situation where they don't really have the support to uh, to to do something like this and recognize um, uh, more deductions in in, in year one. Uh, questions on this? As soon as been up, Mister Internet. International's uh, alley right here. <laughs> nope, we good. Yeah. Questions on our end here. Now y'all got it all figured out. You even got me up here for it. I'm just telling y'all old news. So, <laughs> so this is so real estate professional status. Um, I know this is kind of the hot hot button. Everyone's trying to get this status and. Um, Basically, what it is is that, as we as discussed before, is like you're limited to like what passive losses you can offset against your W two uh, self employment income or any business that you're actively involved in, uh, because active and passive is like oil and water to the oil and water to the IRS. Unless you qualify for certain things, one as I mentioned earlier. Your adjusted gross income is less than a hundred thousand, so you got a limit up there. If you sell your rental property, the the losses um, offset can can now be recognized on your tax return um, as well. And then if you qualify real estate professional status, you can now recognize all losses in any year that you're claiming it um, with no limitations. 
So to to your point, Mark. Uh, so this is kind of the next part of the the question. Now uh, to answer your question is like if if because can you be a W two employee and be a real estate professional status? I'm 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 always saying it's a no, uh, but it's not impossible. Uh, I I never want to be completely negative because I'm working with a client now who in all of 2019 he basically worked out and worked he worked in the field for his company but instead of going to the job sites he was going to his property sites and he was written up multiple times but not like not being able to validate where he was and hours and in january of 2020 he got fired for lack of performance so technically like I say I have a situation where someone with a full-time job like was able is, is probably able to claim it, but he got fired from his job. Now, if you're willing to go into those <laughs> into those extremes for your real estate career, like more power to you. Like that's I thought it was pretty dope that he sacrificed it from that standpoint. Because here's are the standards that like, you have to qualify for these two things. And it's like you and if you're married or your spouse more than 750 hours and then more than half your work time. Uh, so that's why I say it, it's difficult for a W-2 employee initially because let's just say the average employee works 2,000 hours a year, which is quite a bit. So to sit here and say that someone worked 2,001 in a real property trade or business, like, ah, you're not really paying the, uh, a, a, a valid story for the IRS and the tax courts uh, for, when, for when that time comes and they, and they pull your card on that. And also you have to materially participate in your own rental activity so this can be contributed by you and your spouse if you're if you're married um but it's almost it's it's, it's not just okay you you're you're you're, you're doing it so i like i do the accounting for all my properties like obviously but that that's that, like that's not me materially participating in the rental in my rental portfolio because i cannot do the numbers and and, and do the books and the property still goes on without a hitch uh, from that standpoint so it really is more like property management uh construction from that standpoint is, is how you truly are maturely participating in that property and and let you and also let your passive investors know that them investing into your deal like does not does not mean that they're maturely participating because they're not making any management decisions yes they put the money but like you are the one making the management decisions or at least your property, your third-party property management uh, management company is from that standpoint, because um, I get a lot of um, uh, investor calls and they're trying to get that get this qualification. And I had one on Saturday uh, where they had to basically amend their previous two years because their previous tax professional had them claiming their losses as if they were real estate professionals, and it's like all they were doing is just passively investing in these deals. Um, so, so I say at a high level, you can kind of get like, it's, it's such a case by case scenario, but more likely than not, like people are, are not qualified for this, but there are situations where people are hesitant to even do it because, uh, because how highly litigated this status is, but it's like, if you can, if you can prove it and you can doc and document that you can prove it, then you should be taking advantage of it as well. So, um, questions? Comments, concerns. Seems like no one have any questions. That's quite interesting. Let me take a look. I think I may have may have, may have put everybody to sleep by now. <laughs> Just a quick question on this. Uh, you mentioned if your spouse or like if you're head of household. I know it doesn't apply to me, but um. If your spouse can, can qualify as a real estate professional, can you still file jointly or? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of times, so the the funny part about like real estate professional status was really created because physicians and doctors were, they, they, they make a lot of money and then they'll dabble into Zillow and claim that they're real estate professionals and claim all these losses. And it was like, you didn't do anything but search on, um, on, on Zillow and that doesn't count. So what now what, what a lot of them do or people are high income earners, if their spouse isn't working, they'll get their spouse somewhat involved in real estate and they can easily hit the 750 hours because they're not working. 
so that half the working hours doesn't really matter. And then they they may deal, they may uh, personally manage the property manager or may manage the property themselves. So like it's really only you or your spouse has to be a real estate professional, but both of you can actually contribute to being materially participating in your rental uh, uh, rental portfolio. Appreciate it, Ken. Yeah, for question from Sean Harris, who's asking, can I invest in real estate without a W-2? Yes. You should be investing in real estate, period. <laughs> w-2 or not W-2, like, you should, like, like especially with any additional uh, income that you have from your, from your W-2 that's not going to um, cost a living for you, like, it's, like, I think, that in my opinion, for true wealth in this in this country in this time, like real estate is is is, is a must in order to do so. Um, but yeah, even without a W two, if you got the if you got the means or the at least the deal, that's the thing with commercial real estate that you all probably know this. Where it's like you're bringing in investors, you have the knowledge to do it. You may not have the capital, but like I said, you have the ability to put the deal together was get you a spot on the GP side and you take advantage of it from that, from that standpoint there. Gotcha. So quick question for you now, um, in regards to passive investing. So how does a passive investor. Hold on, hold on. What, 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 what did Sean just say? No, don't oh, be scared. Said, don't said, be I scared, Sean. You. Don't be scared. <laughs> You got, you got, you're in, a, you're in a great group right here. Like you got a lot of support. Like that's the thing with, with just, I mean, I've realized when going from single family to multifamily, the network is just, just, just crazy how to support everybody is. Uh, so definitely lean on your team and, and go from there. But you don't have to be an agent. Like that's like, that's another false, like, like real estate professional status isn't a, a job requirement like you don't have to be a real estate agent you don't have to be a property manager you have to do certain services like i provide a spreadsheet to all my clients of which hours count and you can do multiple things and still qualify so sorry mario just got caught up in the word scared <laughs> oh, no no it's perfectly fine for I, I was gonna address that probably after the presentation in one of the breakout rooms i'm glad you tackled it head on but um, my question for you was, so as um, as a passive investor, how, let's say I was a passive investor, how would all of this benefit me? So if depending on what you're doing as a passive investor, I, I rec always recommend to my passive investor, if you want real estate professional status, if you're not married, like go find a small property near where you live at, where you can be somewhat involved and somehow possibly reach this status here. I'm assuming you're just talking about real estate status or, you, or real estate professional status. You're talking about everything else. Uh, it could be either or. Yeah. So, I mean, in the, in the aspect, so it still goes back to instead of worrying about reducing your tax liability, first of all, at least investing in real estate um, can increase your income that's not going to be taxed. So, even as a passive investor, you're uh, you're getting K ones from 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 Mark's company and and Mr. International's company, and they got these syndications coming in. So you, you're making this income, but they're giving you K ones with losses uh, from that standpoint there. So you're able to get preps and all that good stuff there, um, and, and take advantage of it from that from 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 that standpoint. Uh, so and then like you're kind of getting more into the weeds of okay, like but can you also take advantage and and, and have losses? um on your tax return from your real estate depending on where your income is if you qualify real estate professional status uh depending on okay what, what how how is mark k1 looking at year three or four at this point is it still kind of producing losses from that standpoint so that now you can still once again make money that's not taxed and then even reduce your tax liability from that standpoint there okay now for um i think we have a couple of new um newbies in the space here so for those who don't know what exactly is a k1 so so k1 is is a a report generated from the business tax return whether it's a 1065 partnership or 1120s 
um, S Corp or, or 1120 uh, C Corp tax return. So if you're in a partnership or in a had an S Corp or in a, or C Corp, you pre, you have that tax return. So to for everyone to get their particular portions of what that net income or net loss is going to be. All the activity is summarized onto a K-1 and then your percentage or your portion is, is, is recorded up there and then you have to file on your personal tax return. Awesome. So all the new people, I hope you, you picked up. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just shoot your questions away. Yep. Happy to answer any questions. So. Um, we're cool. Um, so we good. So I think I have one more question here from Sharice Bennett. She said, this is great information, but as soon as to be a real estate agent, the info seems advanced. This will make a lot of sense once on the job. So I'm not quite understanding your question, Sharice, if you don't mind unmiking yourself and uh, posing um, your question again. So basically what I'm saying is, um, as like, I didn't even take my exam yet, um, but this, it seems like great info, but will it all make more sense once I'm doing this, like on the job day to day, basically? Or will this make more sense having a mentor? Are you talking about the? Are you talking about everything that we went over tonight so far, or just real estate professional status? Correct. Like what we're going over right now. Well, I think the 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 latter is that yes, if you're gonna have a mentor, like that's always going to be helpful. Um, it kind of goes back to my first section of having the right tax professional, because uh, once again, um, the the aspect of having um, being a real estate agent. And, and being an investor are still two separate things. Exactly. You, you can benefit for everything that you're talking about tonight without being a being without being a agent. Um, but then, like I said, I have I have agents who can't take advantage of any of the stuff um, that we talked about tonight because they're not investors at all. Um, so a lot of a lot of my agents believe that they can be real estate professionals. Like, okay, you can, but you you're, you're kind of you're just you're just covering step step one. You're not covering step two because you don't have any um, uh, any, any investment properties yourself. So even uh, if my agents are passively investing in someone else's deal that's producing a loss, uh, they can't claim those losses on their tax return depending on where their uh, excuse me where their just gross income is. Got it. Okay. Thanks. I think I think more you get involved and like more that you like. We talk network and you know you like you'll it, it'll start to it'll start to click at that point because you're just surrounding yourself uh with people who are doing this or who can who can explain it probably better than i can um from that standpoint no it totally makes sense thank you thank you uh, i got another question mark like it's like multiple parts but the same question shoot, 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 shoot. um question larry um, using your crystal ball, like, you know, saying, <laughs> saying about like these, these tax changes coming up, do you, I have not heard anything about the real estate professional status going away. I think that might be a possibility. And two, if, if like the changes made to 1031 will it affect, can they, can they make it like retroactive or affect this year? Or is it only like 2021 going forward? It, it most well, I guess in 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 the whole to answer your question, the whole like anything they that change will probably it's not going to negatively have a negative effect of anyone if anything is retroactive, because they are punishing people for they 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 don't want to see a punish people for past acts that were deemed uh, legal at the time. Uh, from that standpoint, um, they haven't brought up real estate professional status is because the because. I mean, I forget what it was 19, I feel like 1980 something. So when real estate professional status was first came up, they eliminated all possibilities of passive losses to uh, offset active income because people were abusing it. Um, I say mainly physicians and doctors from that standpoint there. They had to amend it with these two requirements on the screen so that you can prove that you are. So like 
so they're not going to take take away something where, okay if you really are a real estate professional with a uh, rental activity and you can claim you, and you have losses because I mean, whether it's whether it's a bad investment or it's a great investment you got great depreciation um that's creating the losses they're going to keep that intact there so that's part of the reason why that uh rep stats had brought up in the tax changes because it was already changed to a point where it was already i say it's very difficult to claim anyway like it's a, a very high this is a very high ceiling um people think 750 hours is easy to get like like it, that 13 hours a week is tough <laughs> I see people struggle with it and they don't have a job because rental real estate is considered per se passive and spending that much time in it, especially if you're not a agent, like that's when it, when, it, when it does become beneficial if you are an agent or a property manager and you're working a job, working that type of job from that standpoint there. The 1031 aspect of it, I find borderline hilarious, but still funny because you can you can almost create your own 1031 without going through that process um and it's all about kind of changing your mindset of do you want to defer the taxes or selling that property and deferring it to another property which is what 1031 is or do you want just to eliminate that tax um, and you do that by you sell the property um and then before the end of that calendar year you're able to find something with a high enough cost basis where you can get a cost segregation, drive up depreciation, and have the losses from that new property offset the gains from the old property. So, so when people tell me they worry about 1031s going away, and it's like there's another way to do it. Um, like I say it's it, it's just it still requires you finding another property, but you have now a larger window because you're not stuck with finding the property in 45 days and closing on it within 180 days. Yeah. Yeah, and you said that I got remind me. I, I know a couple of syndicators that would promote by saying, "Hey, we have a Kate like from from the syndicators from last year, like because you you get pat you get, you get that you you can't turn ten thirty one as an LP. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you can except for like a tick and stuff. But if you get passive losses as an like an LP from like a big cost segregation the first year, you could use those to offset your gains. Correct." Yeah, cause yeah, cause you, cause if you haven't been able to use those losses in those years they occurred, they just kind of sit in purgatory, waiting on uh, passive gains or passive income to eat up against. So when they do sell, you get that K one with that, excuse me, that huge that huge uh, income number on it. And then you're uh, you got those losses you can kind of fall back on from there to help offset some of that. But yeah, like I said, you can tend like I said the whole tick process to. Um, and for those that don't know, tick is t um, tenants in common. It's a very convoluted process. You're, you're almost like a separate set of books um, to track um, those investors who are trying to offset, basically defer their gains into another an another uh, passive investment. From that standpoint, um, a lot of GPs that I, that I know that like just they just avoid it unless someone's bringing in. Um, a lot of a lot of money is like six plus figures <laughs> for them to, to, to go through that hassle of dealing with it i don't think we have any more questions from the chat and for those who do not know exactly what a 1031 exchange is and you might be new i just dropped the the definition in the chat for you guys. So if you have any questions in regards to it, feel free to unmute yourself and, and you know, ask your question. And this is kind of piggyback what Mark put in. And I guess and basically you're taking the gains from the sale of one property and you're, and you're using that to roll into another property and you're, you're buying another property with those gains. So you're not taxed. Um, you're not taxed on those gains uh, because you use it to acquire another property within the time frame and other requirements that uh, the IRS allows. So that's um, basically, I mean, you kind of hear about that like in, in opportunity zones and all that, but I know I'm kind of getting to the weeds, but, but that's kind of a high level way to explain it on top of what uh, Mark is that's doing in the chat. Hey, Larry, great, uh, great presentation here. I just had a question on depreciation recapture. Um, mm -hmm. could, 
could you fill me in a little bit on what that looks like? You know, as I was reading, um, it seems like there's a max uh, tax rate that they would charge for a portion of the uh, recapture, but we'd love to hear a little bit more on how that works. Yeah, so at a high level, let's just say back to our million dollar property um, example. Um, let's just say in year five of your syndication, uh, the value went up to two million. So in in your mind, you use like you you got capital gains of a million. Uh, if only life was that simple. Uh, so, but what you I remember doing that five year period, you. Cl- claimed up to let's say five hundred thousand dollars of of depreciation which is actually bringing your cost basis down to five hundred thousand so instead of a uh, a million dollar gain you're looking at 1.5 million dollar gain that you're going to be taxed on uh, from that standpoint at uh and because it's um a long term we're looking at uh 20 percent of a capital gains tax from that standpoint there, depending on everyone's everyone's particular separate uh, um, tax or uh, adjusted gross income, because that's the highest is 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 twenty percent at that point. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, if it's less if it's less than a year that you sell it, then you kind of dealing with short term capital gains, which is just your um your ordinary tax rates and whatever bracket you kind of fall into from that standpoint there so if you kept if you kept it for less than a year great stuff You're getting fun cool so um I really just want to kind of end on a light note. So I think a, a lot of times people don't take advantage of, especially as investors, is investing where 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 you like spend a lot of time at or vacation from that standpoint. Basically, wrapping more of your personal life into like your business. Like I have a client whose wife is from Morocco, and and I've recommended like you. And have a have an investment property in Morocco, so now you have a legitimate business reason to be in Morocco. Um, now we're looking at okay, how much are their like their flights mean stuff for their kids, unless the kids are involved with the business that they can kind of write off. Uh, so that goes with properties that okay, you may be looking at properties, or maybe your own investment property. Uh, conferences, trainings, and other business events, uh, meeting with your investors or meeting with your team or meeting with your tax pro. I, I live in Virginia Beach. I'm about 30 minutes from the beach, so you want to holler at me. We can, we, can, we can go meet and then we go go, go chill on the beach for a bit. Um, but it all has to be somewhat planned ahead a bit uh, where you're spending more than half your time working. not saying that you guys, we're talking about eight-hour days. And I'm not saying you have to work a full eight hour day. It's like, okay, you spend half the day in meetings and viewing properties in the morning. Okay, we're gonna hit the club uh early, uh and, and, and party uh party in, at that point at that time. So it's how you get your that's how you kind of figure out how to mix your fun activities with your business act do your doing your business schedule as well. Maybe you have certain meetings um in the afternoon, so you may do do more family stuff during the day during the morning uh, also considering that your travel days are considered business days it doesn't matter how long you travel for it could just be for an hour flight that's that day is now considered a business a business day that is now going to go into the total of what we're looking at from a, um, a total business time versus personal time from that standpoint which allows people to kind of somewhat extend their vacations slash business trips for example um, I'm going to the multifamily investors network event in Miami, July 24th. If anyone's interested in doing that, uh, I have one of my, um, uh, investment partners live in Miami. Uh, I have two clients that live in Miami. So, so outside of just going to that investment event, like I'm going to be discussing with them and then we're going to have a good time. Uh, so I'm able to kind of, once again, mix in uh, a mini vacation into this business trip of mine 
especially since the kids won't be with me or the wife. So I'd be pretty solo at that point. So I, I will be will be taking some part in in the club and in Miami. So, but <laughs> uh, but but that that's, that's just once again like that's already two months from now. But I'm already planning ahead so that we can get these things in place. So I can put the documentation of okay, we scale these meetings here. The event is all day on Saturday. So how do I make sure I coordinate all of that so that I can fully write off this trip um, from that standpoint, from the flight, from the, the Airbnb, meals, everything. And as Bud eloquently put it, it's called networking, guys. <laughs> um, but... So now what we I went through a whole bunch of stuff now. I mean now it's just I like this slide because like now let's let's meet with some professionals, uh start to put a plan in place for everything that we discussed, whether you're trying to be a real estate professional, uh or you're trying to meet with your contractors and look at how you want your invoices itemized so you can start making more write-offs. And then it's execute and reassess at that point. Um, as I mentioned, like your team and your tax including your tax pro should be involved in all this process. And that's part of that evolution of that relationship to kind of see, okay, okay, I couldn't get the contractor to give me the invoice, but can we write off? Okay, do we need to switch contractors? Um, is it is it worth it at that point? Maybe not. Um, can you even qualify real estate professional status? How much losses, passive losses could you claim? So going through this whole process, but not just um, your just your investment team and your investors, but with your tax pro, with your legal, like basically everyone that you're involved with is going to go a long way um, to being able to have the write-offs because that's not the problem. Is like everyone can just write off stuff in the tax return. Just can you sleep at night with what you did? Like it's all the documentation in place so that, okay, if, if or when you get audited, you're like, here's everything, uh, do what you got to do and go pound on sand because you're you're following the exact things that the Kiyosakis and the the Trumps of the world are, are doing already. And I'd like to end off with this quote from Jim Rohn: "If um, if anything of my short time of being here, like it's like I'm I'm more more focused on the value of my time." Um, so like I said, doing stuff like this is like having time to do this and, and be able to kind of hang out with my family without worrying about a job. Like that's, that's important for me. So I feel like sharing this is, uh, for everyone. I think, I think we're all somewhat in real estate to get more control of our time, um, without working crazy amount of hours and investing is investing in real estate is one of the best ways, if not the best way to do so, in my opinion. Um, but that's all oh, All I have. Um, if you want to reach out to me, like you can take a picture of this uh, QR code. You'll get access to my to my uh, to my personal page. My got my number, my email, like text, call, email me other podcasts I've been on so you get a bit of a little understanding of of who I am. I say if you reach out to me, give me about 40, 48, 72 hours to respond. Um as we're and then I said those those are my two boys. Uh do you really make your kids read read tax guides? Yeah. And mop the floor. <laughs> uh, is that part oh, of the job requirement there? Yeah, yeah. Mop, mop, mop the floor. Yeah, he's he's your employee. Now you get you pay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. But the go, tax go, guy, I don't know. We're gonna set him up with a Roth account, and like, yeah, we're gonna get him get get, get that right off as well. <laughs> but I I do have a question for you, Larry. Um, in regards to entities, I know I know you're not uh an attorney, and you know you don't do set up entities, but. Is there a particular entity that is more beneficial when it comes to that's tied to taxes when it comes to savings or anything like that? It's it, it truly depends as you're as, as I tell people and I, I constantly try to work with multiple um, attorneys to kind of get their inputs where a lot of them, like the, the best setup at this moment is just have an LLC. 
like, the, you'll get all the asset protection. You'll get all the the deductions from my perspective uh, from that standpoint there. Now, if you're getting more heavily involved with syndications and getting uh, acquisition fees, uh, property management fees, like income that's considered uh, active income, that's subject to self-employment tax. Okay, now we're looking into, okay, do we want to do a S S-corp election? Um, and the timing of that, does that make sense? Uh, if, you, if you're bringing in, I think, if you're netting fifty thousand dollars plus in active income from those uh, fees that you're charging from your um, uh, from your syndications, that's when it may become worth it. But uh, until then, I mean, LLC is pretty straightforward and can, can kind of get what you need from that standpoint, from a legal and um, a tax perspective. So if any, does anyone else have any questions? Because I, I can keep, you know, shooting questions. I don't want to take the spotlight from anyone. Well, since nobody does. So why multifamily from a tax standpoint? Well, I'm always in make sure of, like I said, yes, I'm a tax guy, but at the end of the day, the, the investment has to make sense. Like we don't want the tax tail wagging the investment dog. Um, another geeky account accounting saying <laughs> in, in, in that standpoint there. So if the if the numbers work and we're talking about a good investment, there's like, okay, yes, let's 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 do it. From from the from the tax side, it's all about okay, you're you're able to get more passive income. Passive income is is not subject to self employment tax. It's tax advantage, which means you're not taxed on the gross amount, you're taxed on your net. So you're using, or let's just say you're using the 50% rule as most people kind of starting off with doing it. So half, so as, as you make a hundred thousand dollars on the property, half of that's going to expenses anyway, you're not even going to be taxed on that 50,000 because now we're like, we're going, we're going to implement depreciation from that standpoint. So, so, it, it, so you're able to kind of booster that a bit more. Uh, from a from a tax perspective, and you can still do it from a small multifamily or single family perspective if you're holding properties. Good question. I mean, good answer. So, guys, this is your chance to feel free to unmute and ask any questions you have pertaining to multifamily or taxes or anything that you know you may not have understood from the presentation. You'll never get your answer until you ask. I take it that everyone understood every single thing you said, Larry. Uh, only ones I know that are awake are you and Bud because Bud got his video up. That's the only people I know is awake. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm gonna drop my cell phone in. Like I said, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm kind of taking the Gary V approach for this. So like, I mean, if you have any questions, like please reach out. Like I, I um, I look I look forward. Oh, Sean's still there. Okay, Sean, I see you. Uh, good question as well tonight, but like, please reach out to me. Like I, I'm, I'm passionate about this because I, I want to see, I like the aspect of helping people reach financial freedom, um, from, from that, from that, from the, from the standpoint of, of real estate and, um, just cracking the, the IRS code where we're kind of taking it. It's not just for the Trumps of the world. Like it's for, it's for the newbies. It's for people who's been in it for five or 10 years. Like we all can take advantage of it. It's just. Like working with the right people that understand that aspect of it and growing from there. Awesome, awesome. So, guys, um, feel free to drop your your LinkedIn information and contact information so we can um stay connected to um with you guys. Uh, Larry, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out your schedule to to jump on and educate us. I for sure definitely learned a lot, and I, I will take uh you're you up on that offer as far as reaching out if i have any questions because i'm pretty sure i will come up with a few questions uh after re-watching this whole presentation 